Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. Paul, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, Bernard. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So, um, you know, years ago, and, and, and I don't want to date you or me, <laughs> but, but year, anyway. years ago, um, yeah. I used to watch videos of you oh. um, <laughs> a lot, actually, uh-huh. and, and, um, and some of the things that you taught. And at that time, you were using like an Iron Byron type of machine sure. yeah. um, and shooting videos with that and uh-huh. kind of showing how that worked in the golf swing and then how the human body can do the same type motion yeah um in the golf swing are you still doing that oh yeah absolutely absolutely so um (laughs) just a little background you know i i was a scratch golfer at 17 lost my swing because i started taking lessons at 19 so i was just self-taught started taking lessons totally messed me up you know, and I was literally looking for the answer for 10 years. 1999 came along and, uh, you know, I went on this internet. What is this internet thing? So I, the very first website I ever went to was True Temper. So I'm on their site and I clicked on a video. There was a link to a video and Iron Byron pops up. I'm like, whoa, look at that thing. It, you know, I knew what it was. You know, every issue of golf or every year in Golf Digest, they'd show a picture of it. But sure. this is just a static picture. Now I see a looping video. It just keeps hitting a ball, hitting a ball, hitting a ball. So I'm looking at it and I go, wow, that looks like a golfer. So I grabbed all my Golf Digest magazines. You know, in Golf Digest, there's a swing sequence of a different pro, but pretty much every issue. Sure. So I had this big stack of magazines, brought them over to the computer, and frame by frame, I just kept looking at the machine, looking at the different pros, and every pro I put beside the machine looked exactly the same, frame by frame by frame. So I'm like, wow, pros look like the machine. Why don't I just look at the machine? It's so simple. It only does three things, and it hits every shot perfectly. So as soon as I understood that, I incorporated that into my own swing, and a few days later, I got my swing back after literally 10 years of trying absolutely everything. Wow. It was that, and it took me three practice swings. That's it. Because I just envisioned that or, uh, you know, uh, related the swing, uh, the machine to my own swing. So I understood how the machine worked, thought about it in my own swing, did three practice swings, and literally. I was just hitting it dead straight. And that's from hitting it sideways earlier to that. It was just unbelievable. But it's the first time in my life I didn't try to hit or help the ball in any way with my arms. Now, I I literally just thought of this about two weeks ago. I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, if I was just a, you know, average guy and somebody came over to me and said, hey, you know, uh, you know, just don't hit it with your arms. Well, I'd be going, well, you know, how's that really going to work? I, you know, I need to hit it with something. So what the machine did, it allowed me to understand how not using your arms was going to produce an even better shot. So I had that realize I had something to back up why that was going to work. You understand? Yeah. So if you don't have a reason why that's going to happen. You're already equating X amount of hitting to X amount of power. Then I come along and I say, I don't want you to hit anything at all. And your brain is going, well, I already equate hitting with power. How's this guy gonna make me do nothing and hit it even farther with way less effort? Well, the machine gives you that realization that it can be done. So that was a huge, huge breakthrough. When I saw the machine, it was just like, oh my God, I get it. And the thing is the machine (laughs) was, you know, built, they started building it in 63 and they had it operational by 66, the year I was born. (laughs) How about that? (laughs) Yeah, pretty amazing. (laughs) That's crazy. Yeah, it was just unbelievable. I couldn't, like, yeah, just, I lucked out. I just, I, I knew about, like I said, I knew about the machine. It just, I didn't give it a second thought, you know, but now I see it in motion 
Now it's completely different. It just totally makes sense to me. I figured it out in like two seconds because it's so simple. And it's perfect. And it was modeled after Byron Nelson's golf swing. Like they didn't just put this thing out of thin air. You know, I have people, you know, (laughs) they just don't get how the machine works. How can you copy a machine? Uh, You know, it's only got one arm. Uh, The legs don't move. Yeah, but you're not seeing it. We have a machine that was modeled after arguably the best golfer of all time. Why don't you at least look at it? They didn't just pick it out of thin air. So just give give yourself five minutes to look at it. It might hold the answer. And it absolutely does. So so how do you relate that? So, and I know it does. Huh? I totally agree with you. But, but, <laughs> but, um, but how do you relate that uh-huh. to some of these students um, that helps them? And in other words, when they say, oh, sure. it only has one arm. So what I see... When I see the one arm, yeah. in my in my opinion, is I see both arms together, uh-huh. one on either side of that arm, and right. then when I see the arm go up, I see the player turning, mm-hmm. and then I see the arm go down, I see the player delivering it with mm-hmm. their core, um, right. or the, or what we call, we're, we're, I'm an impact zone, we call it workhorse. Uh-huh. And, and then I see uh, that arm, it's always in front of, those two arms are always in front of their center. Right. So so now when you translate that to, to players when you're showing them that, is that kind of the same concept that you're using for them? Or well, are you just saying, let's just look at this and let's just see what it's doing and let's try to emulate it? Right. Now, the, the arm on the machine represents the golfer's left arm in the backswing all the way to the top. Okay. It's the left arm in the downswing through and past impact. At about two feet after contact, that's when, that's what I refer to as the release point in your golf swing. So that is the only other point in your swing where both arms are perfectly straight. That's with irons. Driver is about three feet after impact. So after the golf club gets to that point, your right arm then takes over because your right arm is now fully extended in through swing, whereas your left arm was extended in the back swing uh, and down swing. So if one arm is extended going back and down and the other arm is extended in the through swing, that maintains the diameter of a circle. So the machine's only got one arm, so it can make a perfect circle and it it's not it's made out of metal so it can turn perfectly circular we have a little bit of lateral in our swing that's why we're only about 70 percent pros you know the machine is a hundred percent so it represents the left arm in the back swing right arm in the through swing which creates the circle maximizing the width of the arc Uh interesting now now have you ever done um like high speed video with that Uh with that unit oh yeah yeah, absolutely. So, and what are you seeing there with what's happening with the club um, at impact and and the relationship to the club and the ball and let's say the lead arm? Well, there is a slight angle between the lead arm and the golf club. They again, they they made it perfectly replicate Byron Nelson's down and through swing. So, in your golf swing, there is an angle between the lead arm and the golf club. So it's replicating that to create the descending blow uh, as the club hits the ball. Like I said, the golf, the arm on the machine and the club is not perfectly stretched out until after impact. So this is one of the reasons <laughs> you're the impact guy. I don't teach impact. <laughs> impact to me means nothing because it's not the widest point of the arc. So I want the mass of the golf club to get to the widest point, which is after you've hit the ball. So. Many people have heard of, you know, swing through it like it's not even there. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you to swing through the ball so the ball will be hit. But, you know, you have to know where swing through it is. Right. If you don't know where that is, in two seconds you will be back to hitting that golf ball again. So this is what the average person is doing. They are trying to hit the ball. Yep. So if you, And that's because of human nature. There's an object sitting in front of you. And especially if you learned golf as an adult and there's an object sitting there, you will try to hit that object. Your brain is saying, the harder I hit that, the farther it's going to go. And that's that's true. But there's a better way to do it. <laughs> it takes way less effort, 
and it goes way farther <laughs> using physics to hit the golf ball. Yes. So, like I say, in with the machine, I'm just trying to maximize the person's arc to the widest point. So just imagine somebody doing a chicken wing. So why would you do a chicken wing? Well, if there's a golf ball sitting in front of you, you will try to hit that ball and hit it hard. As soon as you do that, your forearm muscles are going to contract, pulling the golf club off the ground or, you know, in that buckled position. Now, that would be like Iron Byron starting with an arm at one length, going to the top of the backswing, taking that arm off and putting a bent arm on and trying to hit the golf ball. It just would never work. So the harder you hit, the tighter your arms, the more your muscles are going to contract, making the arc width narrower instead of allowing the mass of the golf club to swing to its widest point. That's why when you see little kids hit a golf ball, they usually have perfect lag, perfect extension through impact, and in the through swing, there's like zero chicken wing. So how does that happen? Yet every single adult that I teach, or that, that learned golf, every person that learned as an adult, they all do a chicken wing. There's absolutely zero body rotation. And I have to explain all this and get them to do it a whole different way. Yet a kid does it in two seconds. So how does that happen? Well, if the club is real heavy to a little kid, they don't have any arm strength to try and hit hard. So they have to use their body to hit that ball. So right from the very beginning, a kid learned how to use their body, an adult didn't. So fast forward 5, 10, 15 years later, where a little kid's done it, now they become a pro. And a lot of, like, just think back, how many tour pros ever learned the game as an adult? You know, there's all of three that I know of. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know of many either. So, I mean, there's, there's very few. Yeah. Calvin, Pete, and I um, ah, can't remember the other one, Larry Nelson. That was it. That's all I've ever heard of. And Greg Norman was 16. <laughs> right, which is so, essentially still a kid. So Right, exactly. So yeah. you would think if, you know, if this was that easy, you know, why aren't there more mid players in the mid that started golf in the mid 20s? You know, by the time they were, you know, 35 or 30, they became a tour pro. It's not going to happen because right from the very first ball you ever hit as an adult you will hit it with your arms. That is the opposite. The machine is not doing that. The, the arm on the machine is just a piece of metal. <laughs> There's no power in it. Right. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. but <laughs> No, no, I'm, it definitely does. And and I know that, that due to that, that release always happens later. Um, and I see so many players trying to get that rele releasing everything before uh -huh. yeah. um, yeah. into the ball as yeah. opposed to releasing after. Now... Do you um, use any other sports in your in your instruction to um, to yeah. basically uh, like as a metaphor for players Absolutely. to see that easily? Absolutely, every sport incorporates the same three elements of the machine. So you know, there's been a lot of talk. Oh, baseball! You know, that's nothing like golf. I, I get it all the time. Oh, I was doing a baseball swing, and this guy told me I shouldn't do a baseball swing. Well, why would you not do a baseball swing? That incorporates the same three elements. Circular body rotation, you have a loose hinge in your wrists, and you do it on an angle, whatever angle the pitch is coming in. Throwing a ball, you would throw a ball not with your arm, you throw a ball with your body. You would turn your legs and hips, your body, your wrist would be very loose along with your arm, and that creates that whip of the throwing motion. So every sport incorporates those same three elements. The problem in golf is it's the only game with the ball stationary. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you put a stationary object in front of someone, human nature will tell you to hit the object. And it'll tell you to hit it hard. And that's the whole problem. So you've got this whole, you know, population of golfers out there that are all just sitting there that, you know, they learned as an adult and they're just sitting there trying to whack that ball. And they will just sit there forever. They'll get to about a 10, maybe, you know, or a 12 handicap and that's it. They will never do it consistently and never get to the next level until they start to use their body. And it's just a fact. <laughs> you cannot get to that level without using your body. You just can't. Oh, I totally it's agree. I believe yeah. that, and I've always felt that way. And, and as I, um, you know, grew to understand it mm -hmm. and then began teaching, um, yeah. I found that, that the core, that the body that is really the driver, the engine to the golf swing, 
uh -huh. and without that motion, um, you're never going to get pure impact. You might, Absolutely. you might occasionally, accidentally, right. yep. um, but consistently, it's, n it's just not going to happen. Never. Exactly. The way I describe that is, you know, I, I tend to ask a lot of people, have you ever hit that one shot in your life that went 30 to 50 yards farther than any other shot? And every single person says, yep, I've had that shot. So I say to them, you know, what did that shot feel like to you? And they all say it felt effortless, felt like nothing, felt like I didn't hit anything at all. That's no arms. That's powerless arm. That's you couldn't have used your arms on that one shot because you would have said, that felt like I hit it as hard as I could. Not zero people have ever told me that. They all say it felt effortless. Well, if you turn your arms off, now you're gonna have to use your body. Problem is on the next shot, the person sees this amazing shot. Now they try to hit it as, as hard and now they do the next shot with their arms and then the whole thing falls apart. So, <laughs> you know, for me, it's like, You've already hit a shot 30 to 50 yards farther than your best shot. Why would you not want to do that swing all the time? That is the swing you should be looking for. And that's what I teach. <laughs> it's just that simple. So uh, before we continue, Bernard, we should probably explain um, a little bit more about the machine, how it works, so people you know, yeah. watching and listening can understand the machine. Because I literally talked to a pro yesterday showed him my business card and my on my card I have the the picture of Iron Byron mm -hmm. and he didn't he he said it wrong <laughs> that's what I mean it's not um, it's not simple to understand if you don't know what you're looking at I just I got it right away but many people don't get it so as soon as you start to understand it and see it then you know it becomes crystal clear what you should be doing so we'll hopefully I'll send you a picture of the machine so we can show everyone. But if you don't know, it's called Iron Byron. You can just type that in. You know, obviously, a lot of my stuff is going to come up because I've been using the Iron Byron since sure. 99. Sure. But when you look at and the, the machine was designed by True Temper to test shafts. OK, so True Temper is a shaft company. They wanted a machine that would replicate a human golf swing. So many, many years ago, they took high-speed photos of all the top amateurs and pros of that era. This is back in 1963. So they had all these pros. They measured all their numbers and all the angles and everything. And what they found was all pros, and this is not me saying this. This is the inventor of the machine. When I interviewed him, this is what he said, all pros had amazing similarity in their swing. This is what allowed us to have a machine concept. All pros had amazing similarity. We chose Byron Nelson because he had the most efficient swing, least amount of energy for the maximum distance hit. And his numbers never changed throughout the whole day. He was the only one whose numbers stayed the same throughout the day because they measured them all day long these the people they were trying to decide who would they would build the machine after so the least amount of energy for the maximum distance hit so when you look at the machine most people look at it and they go well the legs don't move so it's got red legs on it that's because the legs aren't your legs they don't represent the golfers legs there's a motor just above the legs that represents the golfer's legs. Now, if we take the arm off of the machine, there is a drive shaft sticking out of the top of the machine. So I get this one all the time too. It has no shoulders. Yeah, it does. Because that drive shaft represents the golfer's upper body from the waist up. So in your golf swing, you would be coiling and uncoiling in not a perfect circle, but it's a circular rotation. The drive shaft of the machine rotates in a circular motion. Then connected to the drive shaft is an arm with a hinge and a golf club. Like we said earlier, the arm represents the golfer's left arm in the back, down, and through swing, that, or to, to just past impact, then the right arm takes over in a fully extended position. 
And at the end of that arm is a loose hinge. That represents the golfer's wrists. So your wrists in your golf swing need to hinge and rehinge. A hinge in life is loose. So what we were talking about earlier, if you try to hit the golf ball hard with your arms, the harder you hit, the tighter that hinge, the slower the golf club moves. Mm. The more you manipulate the face, the more you do a chicken wing, start you know, swinging over the top. All of these issues are caused because you're trying to hit the ball hard with your arms. So in very simple terms, this is what I teach, is circular body rotation, a loose hinge, and you do the whole golf swing on an angle. That would be referred to as your spine angle. You want a constant forward tilt or constant forward, you know, constant spine angle. So I only teach three things because the machine only does three things and it hits it perfectly every single time. So that's just so people understand, you know, what we're what we're talking about. A lot of people don't get it. So. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I hope so I mean, yeah, yeah no, I've, I've been looking at that Iron Byron probably, you know, uh -huh. since for years. Yeah. You were the very first person who I saw with that. Um, the, the, the first time that I ever saw Iron Byron in person was, um, I want to say, probably in 2004. Mm -hmm. And it was at Mizuno research oh. and development facility yeah, sure. sure and they set up an iron byron and they demonstrated it and showed uh -huh. it hitting balls and uh -huh. it was it was quite remarkable you just mesmerized sitting there going wow this is unbelievable it 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 becomes hypnotic it's like every ball is dead straight perfect you know they can hit it 250 they can hit it 300 whatever but that ball will go dead straight yep like, and that's the thing, you know, I get people just blowing my stuff off like, oh, you can't copy your machine. Like, why would you not just take five minutes of your life to just understand it? That's the part that is just mind boggling to me. You got a machine that was modeled after one of the best golfers of all time. Why not just look at it for five minutes and just figure it out? You know, it's it's just crazy. Well, so <laughs> I think there's always naysayers. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah. And, there, and there's always people who are non-believers and then are always <laughs> going to try to... Um, uh, look at the negative side of, of things sure, as sure. opposed to other people who are like, yeah, let's check this out. I mean, it's, I mean, what the heck, if this thing is hitting balls straight all day long, right. maybe if I try <laughs> to do something remotely close, you got it. Then I'm going to start to make things happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, it, when I actually went to uh, the true temper test facility in Tunica, Mississippi, I got to hit balls right beside Iron Byron. So I'm probably the only one in the world that's ever done that. <laughs> and I tell you, it was just the most amazing experience. It was just incredible. Like I said, that it just hits it dead straight all the time. So not only did I understand, though, what made the machine hit perfect shots, I also thought to myself, you know, this machine was made by True Temper to test their shafts. They don't hit perfect shots with it all the time. They want to hit slices. They want to hit pulls. They want to pull hook it, top it, sky it. So I thought to myself, you know, what would they have to do to the machine to make it hit bad shots? As soon as you know that, now you can fix your own golf swing. Mm. And you know what? I'm never wrong. You know why? Because the machine is never wrong. So <laughs> when I go to fix someone's swing, I don't see them. I'm not looking at you hitting a ball. I'm looking at you as the machine, so I can figure you out in like two seconds because it only has two moving parts and a third element of it being tilted. So I can fix the swing or at least start getting to the root of the problem instantly because, like I say, I'm not seeing you hit a ball. I see you as the machine. Now I just figure out why is your machine not working? So I'm not sitting there guessing. Now pre-1999, before I saw the machine, I was just guessing, <laughs> you know, why does this guy, you know, why is he hooking it? Uh, you know, why does he hit a slice? Like, I, I don't even think like that. Like that, that just, uh, like it just is, uh, I'm, I'm so crystal clear focused on instantly starting to fix your golf swing. And like I say, it's never wrong. 
So I just instantly start fixing the person. Like, like, and I'm talking guys that are just like, and, and ladies that are just, you know, they've been to everyone. Nobody can fix their golf swing. But like I say, I just see it differently. I don't see you as you. So, you know, it, I just get right on to the fix. And then once the person kind of knows that, it's like a huge relief. You're not going to sit there for, you know, week after week going, why am I hitting this ball fat? Like, to me, that's like two seconds. What I try to explain to people is after you kind of know this, the first shot is your bad shot. The second shot is your first attempt to fix it. And by the third ball, it should be fixed because you know what you're working on. Like, I sat there for 10 years trying to get my golf swing back. And this is every day, all day, for 10 years. And I couldn't do it just by whacking golf balls, you know, and experimenting. And I'm just sitting there guessing. That just, that doesn't happen to me anymore. I just don't even think like that. It's like as soon as I hit a bad shot, I'm already on to fixing it. And like I say, within three balls, it's fixed. <laughs> like, wouldn't that be great? Like, <laughs> so many people are out there struggling. Like I said, uh, about, you know, a few months ago, I saw this guy. He comes out to the range. I was, I just finished up with a lesson, so I'm just standing around. And I'm watching this, you know, just an average golfer. He came up. He was about, you know, 10 yards away from me. So I just thought, I'll just watch this guy for a sec. So he starts with a sand wedge. You know, he hits the first few pretty good. Then he starts shanking it. And then he keeps shanking it and keeps shanking it. Kind of takes a break for a sec, comes back, you know, hits a couple good ones again, starts shanking it again. It's like, well, I'm looking at him going like, what are you doing to try and fix this? Like he had no clue. He made no attempt other than, you know, just trying to manipulate it or do something to try and not, you know, shank the ball. It's like, but that that's just with everyone. Like they, people just aren't crystal clear focused on what fixes these issues. So, you know, there's just so much time and frustration out there. You know, so what does a person do like that once they can't fix their swing? You know, they go buy a new sand wedge or buy a driver. It's like, oh my God, it's like, it's so easy. It's so much simpler than that. Like, why would you do that? But if you don't know, you're going to try anything at that point. You know, and that's when we start getting confused and, you know, we get frustrated and it just becomes a never ending circle, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that that's true with, with most golfers is they'll first look at, they'll try to buy new equipment, uh -huh. thinking that that's going to change it. Yeah. Um, they might go to a different instructor mm -hmm. um, and they might still get different in information. Uh, it might work for a little bit, yep. but they're still too ball focused mm -hmm. um, and not focused more on, on the, what has to happen and where the release Absolutely. has to happen. Absolutely. Um, and things of that nature. So yeah. now do you use that for, let's say, a player has, um, let's say, a 30-yard pitch shot? Uh-huh. And, and are you using a smaller version of that swing? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want people to be able to dial in very precise yardages. So something like a pitch shot, basically what's happening there, people are just guessing. Why, why I'm saying that is because, you know, your average person is not practicing out there, you know, hitting pitch shots sort of like two hours a day, like a pro would be doing, you right. know. So your average person, you know, they got a 40-yard pitch. They do a few practice swings, and now they're just trying to guess, okay, I think that feels like 40 yards. Whack. And what are they going to do? If you're guessing, you will look up to see if you hit the ball 40 yards. I don't guess. I know it's going to go exactly 40 yards. Because I'm setting the machine at different backswing lengths. So short shots, that's a short backswing. So very simply, that's the butt of the golf. So I get people to grip down about two inches. As you go into the backswing, you're going to point the butt of the club at the target. That's For me, that's my 10, 20, and 30-yard shot. Grip down one inch, point the butt of the club at the ground into like a three-quarter backswing position. That's a medium pitch shot, 40, 50, uh, yeah, 40, 50, 60 for me. And then I do a full back swing, just like your normal golf swing, pointing the butt of the golf club away from the target 
for 70, 80, and 90 yard shots. So that's basically a full swing. But I want the person thinking hinge going back. So you need to set the hinge. Once the hinge is set into the appropriate backswing length, you then think of your belt buckle, I usually say. Mm -hmm. Turn the belt buckle. You know, for a right-handed golfer, you'd turn it left of the target. Lefties, you'd turn it right. So it's hinge, turn, hinge, turn. So for me, as an example, if I set my medium backswing, pointing the butt of the club at the ground, and I turned my body slow, I would hit the ball 40 yards. So if I have a pin that's at 45, I'm going to fly the ball 40. And, you know, I'm going to allow a little tiny bit for roll. Sure. So that, to me, is my medium slow. Now, if I want to go 50, I do the exact same backswing, and I just turn my medium speed of my body. So I hinge, turn at a medium speed. Now it's medium, medium, that goes 50. How do I hit it 60? I set the exact same hinge. <laughs> now I just turn faster and the ball goes exactly 60 yards. So it's a very, very simple. I spent years hitting pitch shots and within five to 10 minutes I can get, you know, your average person hitting very crisp, perfect pitch shots and I only told them to do two things. Right. Hinge, turn. Yeah. Hinge, turn. That's it. That's all you got to do. So then I reduce the amount of practice time. See, that's one of the things that I've always thought of. You know, since my very first lesson, I knew people led busy lives and it was never going to get better. Everyone was always going to get even busier. So I always thought fast and easy fast and easy. They need to get this fast and easy. So the machine allowed me to simplify it to that level because I was making it complicated. Like I said, I tried everything and I didn't get it. And I was out there every day. Your average person is hitting one or two buckets a, a week and maybe playing once or twice. So you imagine <laughs> like how much more I tried to learn all this versus the average person and I never got it. When I first lost my swing, I hit a thousand balls a day, every day, seven days a week for over two years and I never got it. That was just whacking golf balls, ball after ball after ball, trying, experimenting, everything. And I had to pick my own balls up. I had a shag bag, it held 90 balls, I hit it 12 times a day, every day, seven days a week for over two years. Yeah, try it. <laughs> That's a lot of balls. It is. <laughs> but I was I wanted nothing more than to get my swing back and become a tour player. Like that's all I did, that's all I thought about. So when I had lessons and it messed me up, like I was ready to try anything and it was a disaster. Like I've never been so frustrated and depressed in my life. So when I hear about people being frustrated, like you just have no clue what I went through. I've never seen anyone hit as many golf balls as I did. It, it just, uh, in, you know, 37 years now of playing golf, I've never seen anyone even come close to what I did. It was all day, every day. So, you know, the experimenting and frustration, it's just, that's why I'm saying I got to make it so unbelievably simple. But <laughs> simple is difficult. No, and that's there, true. Yeah, less there's a is more, and, and it's not that easy to do less. Right. Well, I'll tell you why simple is difficult, because, you know, first off, you're fighting human nature of trying to hit that golf ball. So when you go back long and or fast or whatever, you know, you're thinking hit the ball and hit it hard. So you've got to overcome that thought. You're not hitting anything. The machine allows you to have that thought because it's not trying to hit anything. It goes from literally point A to point B, A to B, and the ball is hit perfectly every single time. So <laughs> it doesn't know the ball's there. Right. So the ball is at point A and a half. <laughs> so if you go from A to B, A and a half should be perfect. So there's overcoming that. And then one of the big things people don't realize is when a pro does a swing, this is what I ask everyone, okay? They, I say to them, you know, when you see a pro's swing, does it look simple? 
they go, yeah, it looks like they're barely moving, you know. They hit the ball, wow, it's just incredible. It, it looks so simple. Yeah, so why would you be making it complicated? But when you minimize the lower body rotation and you maximize your shoulder coil, that creates a tight sensation on your body. So human nature is telling you to relieve that tightness. So I call it like a spring-like effect with your body. So your shoulders are coiling upwards of 90 degrees around a stable lower body. So your hips would move half, 45. Your knees would move 22 and a half degrees. So you need that ratio. So even if you can only move your shoulders 80, your hips would move 40, your knees would move 20. You still have the exact same ratio. But to get that ratio is a tight, coiled up sensation. So human nature doesn't want to put any stress on your body. So as soon as you start to coil up like that, you will start relieving that tension or torque on your body. Because your brain thinks, oh, I gotta protect my body here, I'm starting to feel tight. So it does one of six things to relieve that. It'll do things like stopping short, you know, um, turning the hips too much, straightening the back knee, moving sideways, lifting the left heel, standing up, you know, so it does all of these things to stop that coil. And as soon as you do that, now you have this overblown looking movement, yet a pro looks very simple and can consistently hit the ball. So the pro is consistently hitting the ball because they're basing it on that spring-like effect and torque, which repeats 100% of the time in life. So if you had a spring and you coiled that up until it was tight and then you let go, it would snap back 100% of the time. So that's what you need in your golf swing. That's what you need to be basing your movement on is a coiling and uncoiling spring-like effect. But like I said, because the ball's sitting there, you're thinking, hit the ball. Well, you're not even thinking of doing the move. So if you're not even thinking about doing it, you will not get that tight coil and you'll just be sitting there hitting it with your arms. So it'll never repeat. You know, and you will not hit it as far and consistently and, you know, hitting the sweet spot and getting the trajectory and all that because you're just whacking at the ball. Like, you know, there's pros. Like if you see a pro with a faster looking golf swing, that would be a pro using their body and their arms. You know, a pro that I would more, you know, like people to replicate would be a Louis Oosthuizen, okay, or an Ernie Els, a Freddie Couples. Like those guys they have that effortless look. That's somebody that's not using their arms. Somebody that would be using their arms, you know, Tiger Woods, okay? In his, you know, when he was just before he stopped playing. You know, the that fast, you know, trying to kill it all the time. Like, the ball could literally go anywhere. You know, he's using his body and his arms in that situation. So to me, that, you know, perfect movement, just, you know, swing within yourself, you know, coil, uncoil, coil, uncoil. Don't try to hit anything. Keep your wrists really loose. And within seconds, you should see half decent shots, but you got to understand why it's going to work. And like I said in the beginning, the machine allows you to understand why it's going to work because the machine hits it perfectly. So... Hopefully yeah, well, the, the body is carrying the arms, and 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 the so arms aren't carrying the body. I always use with uh with my students the metaphor because I like metaphors. Uh huh. And I always use the metaphor of a train with passenger cars, right? Absolutely. So you yeah. have a train that has mm -hmm. an engine. Well, the engine is your body. Absolutely. Then you have passenger cars. Your arms. Yep. Your hands. Yep. The club. Of course. Right. So if the passenger cars try to pass the engine. They're Perfect. jumping off the track. So, I mean, they're <laughs> not going to stay down the, down the line, right? Absolutely. So if the, if the arms are being carried by the engine, mm -hmm. then they're going to just – that engine can go pretty darn fast. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, it, and unless it's going around a steep turn, um, which the golf swing is a turn, but it's not a huge steep turn like a hairpin turn, right? Um, those engine, those passenger cars are going to follow right along, and they're going to stay on that track, and that Absolutely. ball's going to go right down that line, 
as opposed to it jumping the yeah. track and going offline. Absolutely. That is a perfect image for people. And keep in mind that the passenger cars have no power. That's right. They don't have an <laughs> engine in them. And that's what and I try to exactly tell them is like that to. they couldn't push the engine even if they wanted to. Exactly. The problem is your passenger cars have a little bit of an engine in that's them. That's right. They don't exactly. have as big of an engine as your body does, but that's they right. do have a little bit of an engine. So you have to turn that engine off. That's and if correct. you can turn that engine off, I mean, I've always been a huge av advocate of dead hands and all bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the hands exactly will, the hands will know what to do then. I mean, but by the weight of the club, they'll know how to swing it right. if the body takes over. The, you don't have to try to figure it out. It'll do you, it. That's right, because now you're incorporating physics into the swing. So one of the images I give people is, you know, a weight on a piece of string, right? So you got a weight on a piece of string. Your The weight represents your whole golf club, not the head, right. the whole club. That is mass. Your arms represent the string. Your body represents your hand twirling it. So if you did nothing to the weight on the string and you started to twirl only your hand, that hand would or that weight would do two things exactly the same a hundred percent of the time. It would always swing at ninety degrees to your hand because mass moves its fastest at ninety degrees to the axis. Yes. And it would always create the same circle because the piece of string is only so long. So that would be like your arms. So if you did nothing, the weight of the golf club would stretch your arms out fully. That's what happens in the little kids swing. Yeah. That's why I don't like little kids using kids golf clubs. Now we're going to have a whole generation of people that are terrible right from the beginning. Whereas if a little six or eight year old kid went out to the golf course using mom or dad's golf clubs, those clubs are super heavy. So right from the very first ball they hit, they couldn't pull the golf club down because they have no arm strength. They had to use their body. Now, if you put a light golf club in a little kid's swing, they will hit with their arms. And like I said, now you'll have even more people that are bad or in that category of, you know, average golf. Not not bad, but, you know. No, no, no it's, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Bad is comparative to, to playing like scratch. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. they're just going to be average players. They might right. shoot like fifteen, like fifteen over, ten over at the at you know at best. Right. So if you do nothing with the arms, the weight of the club would be stretching it out and you know to its widest point very consistently. All you're doing, just like you said, is using your body. Now the telltale sign, because there's a lot of people out there, you know, they're going to be going, well, uh, how do I know if I'm using my arms? Well. If you are not using your arms, your golf club is going to feel heavy. Not like you've got heavy golf clubs. I'm talking normal golf clubs would feel heavy as you swing them. If they feel light, you're too tight. Because my golf clubs feel really heavy. And I don't use heavy golf clubs. Because I'm allowing the mass of the golf club to fully extend my arms to their widest point. So there's forces acting on that mass, stretching that piece of string out. So I'm, that's what I'm feeling, you know? I, in no way am I trying to hit that ball with my arms. As soon as I do, I start hitting it sideways. And oh yeah, that's why it's imperative arms, to have to be tension free. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, you have to be tension free or you're, you're not gonna be able to create any club head speed. And exactly. you're not gonna be able to create that release happening after the ball. That's right, that's right. Like when I hit a golf ball from sand wedge to driver, my arms feel like butter nothing zero I they don't hurt they're not pulsating they're not radiating in any way what I do feel because I trigger my downswing with my right instep so after every shot I feel a pulsating or radiating in my right inner edge of my uh, big toe my right calf and my right cheek okay rear end cheek <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, no, and absolutely. I feel that on every shot. Yeah, you're pushing oh. off the ground to start that downswing. Okay. I'm using that to turn my body. So if you're feeling your arms, you are using your arms. I don't feel that at all in any way. Pre-1999, I did. 
I was trying to hammer it as hard as I could, and I couldn't hit a fairway to save my life. Sure, because it starts when they do that. It starts the the upper body starting the downswing, exactly. as opposed to starting it from the ground up, which is what you do in all other sports. And people do it naturally in other sports because the ball's in motion coming towards them. They move exactly. towards the ball. You already know the best way to do it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just in golf. You got to tell yourself to do it. Yeah, but if you don't know how to do it, and nobody's ever telling you how to do it, you will just sit there forever. <laughs> because you're thinking hit the ball. Yeah. Like it's, it's a different way to do it. Like there has to be a reason why petite people and junior golfers, like small smaller golfers, can hit the ball a mile. So I had a, I've got a junior, you know, he's uh, 14, and he hits it over 250. And this guy is skinny as a rake. He's probably all of like, I don't know, 5'3", maybe, you know? How does he do it? So I had one guy write in, oh, well, it's, you know, it's the X factor between his shoulders and his hips that allows him to do that. It's like, yeah, but I have tons of adults that can easily coil back just like this kid, and they hit it nowhere. So how does this kid do it? Well, if your wrists are really loose and you turn your body fast, you're going to get a fast release of that golf club. Think of the machine. Right? If the machine's hitting it 200, how do they make it hit it 250? They don't do anything to the arm and the hinge. They just turn up the speed of the motor, which would be your legs and hips. And that's, again, that's not me saying that. That's the inventor of the machine. I, he was standing right beside me with the machine in the middle of it. I pointed at the motor. I said, George, is the motor the legs? He goes, yes. Is the drive shaft the golfer's upper body from the waist up? Yes. <laughs> is the arm the left arm in the back swing and down swing and then the right arm? Yes. Is that a hinge at the end of that arm? Yes. <laughs> is it loose? Yes. <laughs> he backed up everything I said, like the way I saw it. <laughs> so, that's just the way it works. So yeah. like I said, if you don't understand that concept, like how is it ever going to dawn on you to do that? Like I said, you've already done it once in your life. But if you can't keep doing it, you don't know how to do it. <laughs> so, what we're both saying is, here's how to do it. Turn your arms off. If you turn your arms off, you need another power source in your golf swing. Yeah, you got to find it, and there's, only one, right. and there's only one left. Exactly. So basically, the progression that I, you know, I, I kind of, when I'm trying to get people to do my technique and everything... It's, okay, I've got someone using their arms. You know, you could just turn the arms off and, you know, you could get, you'll, you'll see way better results, guaranteed. But basically what I need to do then is teach them how to coil and uncoil their body. So now you're using your arms and your body. And after you've done that for a little while, you'll recognize that the body can work. It, it can do this really, really well. So at that point, now you can completely turn off the arms because you have the other power source working. So there's arms, then arms and body, and then just body. So, you know, that's the progression that I typically see. And, but like I said, if you have been hitting the ball as hard as you can with your arms, just try turning them off. You know, maybe tee up your ball for a little bit just to make it a little easier. Sure. And I, just so you can see some good shots with a little room for error. If you sit there trying something brand new and you top every single ball, you're not going to be that excited to change anything. So you tee it up, you take out a seven iron, and just like I, be as weak as a little kid. Like I'm talking six to eight years old. Just try it. But you can't try it for three balls and think you've got it. Do it for like 30 balls and just see what happens. I guarantee you're going to hit some mind-blowing shots. So typically when I'm working with someone and I get them to do that, they hit the ball about 80% of their best shot with a feeling of nothing. So that's what I call having more in the tank. If I can get you to do nothing and hit it 80% of your best shot, now you have more in the tank to go beyond your best shot. And that's what I was talking about with the 30 to 50 yard farther shot. Right. 
<laughs> by adding more body. As soon as you start turning your body faster, you're going to get a faster whipping action of the club, which then hits the ball even farther. But just think, if, if I get something to, somebody to swing, like they're barely hitting the ball and it goes 80%, yet the person is swinging out of their shoes and only getting a 20% gain. Those aren't good odds. Yeah. You know, if you were swinging out of your shoes and you were hitting it double, I'd say, hey, hey you know, you might want to keep doing that because you're hitting, you know, a, a seven iron like, you know, 200 yards. So keep doing it, you know. But when the person hits the seven iron like 130 and then I get them to do nothing and they hit it, you know, 110 or 100, it's like, wow, maybe there is a different way. So now as they start to use their body, now they're hitting it 140, 150 which they should be with a seven iron. Right. You know, average person should, you know, a good goal would be 150 with a seven iron. Yeah, that's reasonable. In, in that area. You know, I'm not looking for them to be, you know, like a tour pro, but, you know, people need to play, with, you know, to the best of their ability. And I just see so many people, you know, it's like they just hit it nowhere. It's like, oh my God, I can do nothing and hit it by these people. So if I can do nothing, and hit it by you. I'm doing it a different way than you. So why would you not want to learn that way? You know what I mean? That's and that's the thing. You got to kind of explain it and get the person to wrap their head around a different way to do it. And like I said, that's what the machine allowed me to do. And my students just kind of see it once they kind of get that machine concept. Absolutely. Oh, it's, it's really helped out a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it definitely. I, I, and I, I can see how we've both come to the same conclusion in different ways, but, but yeah, we've both absolutely. come to the same conclusion. And, and, um, and, and part of that conclusion for me, too, was also the way that you, with that machine. Um, when I saw oh. you using it, when I saw the machine itself. Thank you. And then I, you know, and I said to people, you know, like, look, there's no, that that arm is not moving independently right. from from exactly. that from that core from that yep. driver. I said so. You have to think more that way. Absolutely. And, and then you're going to do do much better. So if there was a right. book out there that you would recommend for our listeners, um, what book would that be? <laughs> my own golf book. <laughs> so what? So what so book is that? My book is called Swing Machine Golf. So I actually have. Kind of, I, I brought out a new product as well called the Body Swing. Okay. So, Swing Machine Golf is my original product. It's a book, and I have a DVD series or online versions as well. So that uses the machine to explain it in great detail. Then, you know, <laughs> why I did the Body Swing <laughs> is just because I think some people are confused by the machine. They don't get what I do. People right. want to buy the machine off of me. It's like I don't sell a machine. I teach people based on the machine. So to make it even more simple, I called it the body swing. It's very similar, but even easier. So it teaches you how to use your body, not your arms, to hit the ball. So I have, I basically have two products now. But my original one, Swing Machine Golf, that shows frame-by-frame frame footage of me and Iron Byron hitting the ball side-by-side. Side. Like that was the breakthrough for me. That, that just – and – you know, I, I felt I laid it out in a manner. It's step by step by step teaching people, you know, exactly how to copy that machine. Mm -hmm. So so if they want to get in touch with you, our audience, how can they do that? What's their best way? Uh, well, my main uh, website is paulwilsongolf.com. So then um, people can see my different products. I also have swingmachinegolf.com, bodyswing.com, and ignitiongolf.com. So that's a... That's a site with a whole bunch of my golf tips on. I have over a thousand tips on there, all body <laughs> related, you know. So it's all I've never changed the way I've taught for 25 years. I've taught exactly the same way. The machine came in in 1999, and that clarified the results I was getting. Sure. But everything I teach, I've never changed because I get great results, and I, I why would I change? So. PaulWilsonGolf.com. That's where you can kind of find out more about me and that sort of thing. But I also have, you know, other websites as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Paul, look, it was great around. having you. It was great having you with <laughs> oh, us. I mean, you. I really enjoyed it. You know, and, <laughs> and I, like I said, I've watched you for years, and it's really a pleasure to get to talk to you about this. Oh, 
anytime that would be great uh, it's just really cool stuff and and um until we meet again do your best to keep it in the short grass thank you thank you i really appreciate it all right great thanks paul thanks.